The News 4 Rundown is sponsored by FH Fur. As the clock ticks to a potential government shutdown, four days by the way, the list of concern grows around our area. We've got the latest. Metro has teams on the rails and buses to help fight suicide. We'll check in on how this specialized unit is working to save lives. And one local county, a trusty lawn care item is about to be illegal ahead, which gas powered tool has got to go. You're watching the News 4 Rundown. And thanks for joining us for the News 4 Rundown. It's our newscast streaming for you. I'm Tommy McFly, and we've got a rundown debut tonight. Yes, so excited to be here with you, Tommy. I am Amy Cho. It is Tuesday, September 26th, and we begin with a look at some of the top stories we are following. Yeah, let's get started with that. Police have arrested a D.C. man accused of stealing an SUV in which a child was inside in Northeast near Deanwood. Angelo Chinscale was charged with kidnapping last month. The child's grandmother left the two-year-old alone in a running SUV as she went into a 7-Eleven on Nanny Helen Burroughs Avenue. That's when police say Chinscale stole the SUV, which prompted an Amber Alert. And the SUV and the toddler were found a short time later, about a half a mile away. The child was thankfully not hurt. The former superintendent of Loudoun County Public Schools is standing trial. Scott Ziegler is charged with two misdemeanors. A grand jury indicted following an investigation into how the school district handled two sex assault cases in school back in 2020. Witnesses took the stand today, including a teacher. Testimonies wrapped this afternoon with trial expected to resume on Wednesday. Tuesday, the Prince George's County Council's Committee of the Whole passed legislation that would allow remote voting with a final vote expected next week. If passed, it would allow council member Crystal Oriata to continue to, to be voting while she's uh, pregnant. She's the first councilwoman to vote while pregnant and participate virtually during her maternity leave, which is expected to begin in October. Big changes coming there. Yes. Now to a story that will have potential impacts, not just for everyone around the Beltway, although some of our neighbors are gonna be feeling it so much more than others, Amy. Yeah, a lot of impacts for sure. We are talking about the prospects for a government shutdown. Government funding is set to run out Saturday night, and if Congress does not step in, the government shuts down early Sunday. Yeah, small businesses in the district are bracing for another blow after surviving the lingering effects of the pandemic. And Dominic Moody spoke to one restaurant owner about what could be happening and the devastating impact. Brandon, Brandon H. Dealing with one government shutdown is tough. For Bub and Pops on M Street in Northwest, this is the third time the sandwich shop has had to think about the ramifications of lawmakers not finding common ground to fund the government. Workers that rely on the government, they're not going to be here. And that all trickles down into my business. And right now, with prices and inflation being through the roof, the shutdown just hits to me uh, on so many different levels. You got pickup order? Yeah. Jonathan Tao first opened his family-run business in the district back in February of 2013, eight months before the government shut down. You said chicken salad? Yeah. This time around, less foot traffic, high employee turnover, and rising prices for products combined with a government shutdown could mean. The worst case scenario is the rest that you know when, when when they shut down that the city gets so desolate that I go out of business no, but you, we can do that for you. that's the worst case scenario like these are like real this is real like a real factor that I'm you know that I'm weighing in it's not just small businesses and restaurants who could be impacted by this potential government shutdown but here along Independence Avenue and Southwest there is a long line of food trucks that too say they could be shutting their doors if that government shutdown takes effect using the function of our government using the, uh, uh, the the folks in my district, federal workers, contractors, small business owners as pawns is just wildly inappropriate. Lawmakers on Capitol Hill like Virginia Congresswoman Abigail Spanberger say they have heard from small business owners in their district. She tells News 4 the impacts could be detrimental. I represent thousands of small business owners who when they do not have customers come in for a week or two weeks or three weeks, for some of them, it means the end of their livelihood, the end of their dream. Chris with a K. Back at Pub and Pops, that optimism is slowly starting to fade. And Talv says he'll have to play the waiting game for now. I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. 
you know, me personally, in my dreams, everybody who doesn't go to work comes to Bubba Pops to eat. You feel me? So that's what I hope for. I hope for the best. In the district, Dominique Moody, News 4. Dominic, thank you. A lot of extra stress on people because of this. And if you are directly impacted by the government shutdown and your savings, your funds are going a little low, you might be wondering how you're going to manage to just pay those bills. Yeah, such a concern for so many people. Consumer reporter Susan Hogan is working for you with a few tips to help you navigate some uncertain days ahead. Well, that's right. This is a scary time for anyone who's going to be impacted by a potential federal government shutdown. But if you take the time now to get ahead of this, you may be able to lessen the financial blow. Bottom line, though, you have to be proactive. Whether you're a government employee being furloughed or a government contractor, the financial impact of not getting paid is going to be a blow to anyone's budget. So over the next few days, you're going to need to sit down and prioritize your bills. So think of necessities first. You need to keep food on the table, you need to keep the lights on and a roof over your head, right? Um, then you can begin to look at making your car payment and then additional debt payments like any loans or your credit cards now. In the past, creditors and utility companies have worked with employees affected by a shutdown and even offered assistance. So it's important you be proactive and contact them immediately to explain your situation. Ask what type of assistance they offer. Waiving late fees, monthly account fees, and overdraft. Ask your mortgage company about a loan forbearance due to financial hardship. Ask your credit card companies if it's possible to extend payment due dates. And depending how long this shutdown lasts, you might want to file for unemployment. But there's a caveat. That said, by and large, if you collect unemployment while you're furloughed, you will be required to pay it back when you receive your back pay when the furlough has resolved. As for tapping into your retirement account, you might want to hold off on that. You really should think long and hard about borrowing against or withdrawing from your retirement. Like a 401k withdrawal, a withdrawal from the TSP can come with significant costs, um, penalties for early withdrawal, as well as taxes. Um, um, there is also an option to take out a loan, but those come with fees as well. Now, if you are worried about making payments on your student loan, which starts in October, remember that there are several options and programs you can apply to that can help reduce the burden. Just head to NBCWashington.com slash responds for a list of those programs. I'm Susan Hogan, News 4. Susan, thank you. The Montgomery County Council has voted to ban gas powered leaf blowers. This legislation passed Tuesday by a 10 to 1 vote. The bill will issue rebates to those who make the switch to electric power instead. There is an exception for agricultural producers. Not going to miss hearing those at 7 in the morning. <laughs> no. A similar ban took effect in D.C. last year. Part of the reason is because they are so noisy. In addition, there's environmental concerns about emissions. Now, gas-powered leaf blowers will officially be banned for sale on July 1st, 2024. They'll then be banned for use a year after that. And staying in Montgomery County, they introduced legislation on Tuesday that would make sure people who buy guns have information about suicide prevention. Yeah, it's called the SAFE Act. It is meant to prevent suicides and gun violence by getting people in distress the help that they need. The literature would be developed by the county health department and would include information on suicide prevention, firearm safety, and conflict resolution. So far, the measure has survived a legal challenge by the group Maryland Shall Issue. County leaders say they are prepared to defend the SAFE Act. If passed in Montgomery County, gun shops could be fined for not displaying or handing out the information. When a D.C. landlord lost out on a COVID-era rent relief program, he expected someone in the district would help him get the thousands he said he was owed. But more than two years later, no one has. And the News 4i team first told you about this problem with the program last April. But those impacts? They say that they're still getting worse from some business and for some homeowners. Investigative reporter Ted Oberg wants to know why. And he's checking it out with the News 4i team. The state D.C. cases have not moved. John Jones has fought a long battle, and we've tried to keep up with it. This must be over by now. Not even close. The state D.C. program started in the fall of 2020. And shortly after that, both Jones and his tenant in the two-bedroom apartment he owns in Southeast signed up for state D.C. 
a $350 million program that used federal COVID money to help affected tenants pay rent. According to D.C. records obtained by the I-Team, the agency in charge of the program sent the $14,000 rent relief check to John Jones' tenants instead of to him. Jones says the tenants cashed the check but never passed the money on to him, and they still haven't. Jones' case was one of dozens the I-Team found on a D.C. list of suspected fraud cases in the state DC program. Within the last 18 months, there's been no prosecution of the wrongdoers. There's been no compensation for the victims. There's been no accountability whatsoever. Documents from the DC Department of Human Services say they identified at least 120 cases of potential fraud. That's hundreds of thousands of your dollars, but not a single one of those cases has ended up with a single charge here at court. The Office of the Inspector General says it's still investigating. Just weeks ago, the D.C. Office of Inspector General, D.C.'s internal watchdog, issued a report on the state D.C. program, finding it met its goal to quickly help people with rent and utility payments, but said the speed led to weakened internal controls that were insufficient to detect, respond to, and prevent improper payments. The report said errant payments resulted in economic hardship for landlords, finding that at least $396,614 in excess state DC funds were dispersed and not recovered. That's nearly 400,000 of your dollars sent to the wrong people that the DC government and its team haven't gotten back. They can't point to one single case where they've actually pursued the prosecution uh, for fraud at all. While the inspector general wouldn't talk on camera to the I-team, they did send council member Brooke Pinto's office an explanation, admitting, unfortunately, due to the U.S. attorney of D.C.'s workload, the state D.C. cases have not moved as expeditiously as we'd like. That may be an understatement. Jones has been told the only way he can get the money he's owed is if a judge orders the tenants to pay restitution or if he wins a civil suit against his tenants. But those tenants? Where are they today? Still living in the unit, not paying rent. To make it worse, Jones says the tenants who took the 14 grand in state DC money are still in his apartment. My tenants, in my case, have not paid rent in three years, a total of 36 months. What? Three years, 36 months, over $56,000 and unpaid rent. John tells us he recently had to change the locks on that apartment and DC law forced him to give a set of the new keys to those non-paying tenants. We tried reaching out to them, but we haven't heard back. They do have their first hearing in that backlog DC eviction court tomorrow. We'll be there too. I'm Ted Oberg for the News 4 IT. Wow. Still <laughs> in the apartment. I'm yeah, I We know. both were like, I'm, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> yeah, we are looking forward to seeing how this one plays out for sure. And Ted's like, I'll be there tomorrow. Yes, you know he's yes, not he, yes. he's not playing either. <laughs> yes, yeah, <tune> in. <laughs> yes, Ted Oberg, Ted, thank you. Turning to Metro now, Metro leadership says the pandemic, record inflation, and a decline in ridership have all led to budget challenges. We've seen a lot of that mm -hmm. firsthand. And things have gotten so bad, service cuts and layoffs are being considered. Yeah, Adam Tuss joins us with more on the potential impacts, Adam. Yeah, tough news. And while the budget impacts wouldn't take effect until July 1st, the transit agency says that it may have to begin issuing notices this winter to employees about the potential for layoffs and staff reductions for planning purposes. Now look, an ill-timed combination of the pandemic, record inflation, and a severe decline in ridership, they have all taken a toll on Metro's bottom line. And leaders there say, unless there's an increase in the amount of money that the transit agency gets from local jurisdictions, some tough choices will have to be made. What does that look like? Well, in some cases, trains as short as four cars long, increased wait times for riders and bus lines that would be cut, there's even one scenario out there of cutting service by an alarming 67%. And adding to the anxiety of all this, local laws would likely have to be changed in order for Metro to receive funding above the regular amount that it gets right now from local jurisdictions. So that means in a best case budget scenario, the transit agency would still need hundreds of millions more from DC, Maryland, and Virginia 
for the next fiscal year in order to close this gap. There are no easy answers here. Metro leaders say that they're going to hear an initial briefing on the budget challenges this Thursday during a board meeting. But the situation does appear to be dire. Back to you. Thanks a lot, Adam. We know you'll be all over that as well. And speaking of Metro, September is Suicide Prevention Month, and Metro is doing its part to help people who are in crisis. Yeah, they have created a crisis intervention specialist team where specialists will walk up and down the train platforms, go into buses and trains, and find people who may need help. They will approach them, ask them what they need, and try to direct them to the right resources. Now, Metro started this program last year, and since, they say the crisis intervention specialists have connected with over 700 times with customers, employees, and vulnerable populations. They've boarded more than 480 buses, more than 1,500 trains to do wellness checks. The team says they want people to know they're not alone, and there's supports out there, and there's people who care. Yes, such an important message for people to hear. Now, a reminder, if you or someone you know is experiencing any mental crises, the National Suicide Prevention Hotline is just one call away at 988. And we also have a list of resources on our website, NBCWashington.com. Just look under Changing Minds. Coming up, Costco is offering a new service. And it's not in the food aisle. More on how the company is expanding into the healthcare biz. Yeah, really branching out there. Mm -hmm. Plus, an ex exclusive look inside former Washington Wizard Bradley Beal's home. Very fancy there. We will give you the grand tour after the break. Stick around. FH Fur Plumbing, Heating, Air Conditioning, and Electrical is proud to sponsor the Marine Corps Marathon, saluting those who have served and continuing our commitment to hire veterans who have inspired us for more than 40 years to serve our community to the fullest. It is our honor to say thank you. FH Fur Plumbing, Heating, Air Conditioning, and Electrical is proud to support the Marine Corps Marathon. Welcome back to The Rundown. Prince George's County officials are working to establish a task force to address emergency room wait times. The proposed 11-member task force would include state and county officials, hospital workers, and community members. This group would look into best practices and make recommendations to cut down those dreaded ER wait times in the county. County Vice Chair Wallabagay introduced the legislation, and if approved, the task force will also study access and accessibility of health care services and inpatient bed availability in nearby counties. How does a health checkup for just 29 bucks sound? I do love a good deal. This is a new deal from Costco for its members. The online health checkups are in partnership with Sesame, a direct to consumer healthcare marketplace. It connects medical providers nationwide with consumers. In order to access the discount on a range of healthcare services, you would need to verify your Costco membership. And you don't have to buy the memberships in the case of 36. You can get just one at a time. So a concerning report showing that kids are inundated with hundreds of cell phone pings and prompts day in and day out. Something we always knew, but this new research from Common Sense Media found about half of 11 to 17 year olds get at least 237 notifications every day on social media apps like TikTok and Snapchat and Facebook and Instagram and Discord. About 25% of them, these pop-ups are happening during the school day and 5% show up at night. So the report shows the notifications are almost always linked to alerts from friends on social media. 97% use their phones during a typical school hour. I get it. I yeah. mean, it's hard to resist. You know, mm -hmm. I want to know what my friends are up to. If I get a message from them, I'm going to click it. I'm so glad <laughs> I'm not in middle school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I know. Like all the pressures kids have today yeah. and then 237 notifications. Mm -hmm. You Ooh. feel that FOMO. I mean, <laughs> Amy and I are not old, but we used to pass notes. That's I, what we used to do. I know. The little paper airplanes. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Just hope you didn't get caught. You, I know. I know. You may have seen the pictures, but do you know the story on this one? This is pretty cool. Yeah. Look at that. This is a for your home exclusive. Erica Gonzalez is taking you inside the home, more like a palace there mm -hmm. of former Washington Wizard Bradley Beal. It's now up for sale. Could be yours. Hi, Erica. Hi, Justin. How are you? I'm good. Welcome to NBA star Bradley Beal's home. Thank you so much for having us. So tell me about the property, what it's called, the specs, and ultimately how Bradley Beal and his family chose this place to call home. Sure. So this home was built in 2016 by Winmar Construction. It's over 13,000 square feet, six bedrooms, nine and a half bathrooms, 
two basketball courts. Uh, we actually found this house, our agent Jill knocked on this door to see if they would sell the house when we started looking. So this wasn't on the market? It was not on the market. <laughs> okay. They knocked on the door, asked if they would sell. Once they came and saw this house, they knew it was perfect for them. First and foremost, we gotta see the kitchen. Everybody wants to see the kitchen. Take me yeah. on through. All right, coming into the kitchen, wow factor for sure. Yeah, so the builder really built this with like a Miami contemporary chic vibe. Okay. The Beals were really attracted to that when they first saw the house. So you'll see a lot of blacks, a lot of whites, and this is a kitchen perfect for a chef with top of the line Viking yeah. professional series. And what NBA player wouldn't have their own private court? Let me take you to show you I that. I was hoping you would say that yeah. next. All right, I will follow you. To get to the basketball court, we have to come down to the basement. And you can see through the floor to ceiling windows. Oh, wow. There's a basement within a basement underground all the way is where we're going to go to that basketball court. But a quick stop here. Sure. So, uh, uh, who did this? So, this <laughs> is the, the, game yeah, for the, the arcade for his three children. Okay. Where I'm sure they hung out here while dad played basketball downstairs. This is so cool. And then he's got his gym over here, too. He does. So, this is a gym fit for an NBA athlete. I do know that he is missing this anti-gravity machine right now and it is getting sent to Phoenix very soon. And now we're all the way down in the lowest level. This is the court. Okay, now I know that we're in Bradley Beal's house. This, this says it. So was this already here when they bought the house or did he add it? Yeah, this court was actually already here. The only thing that he changed was he ripped out the floor to put in these authentic NBA hardwoods so he could get that authentic basketball bounce. The bounce, okay. Yeah. Welcome to the primary suite. Light filled room, beautiful. But what I really want to show you is the his and her closets. Okay, so this is her closet. This is her closet. It's got a ton of storage as you can see, the center island with the marble. It's got the marble makeup vanity with sink. Where's his dressing room? His dressing room is gonna be through the bathroom on the other side and it's a converted bedroom. Oh, okay. So he was generous enough to let his wife have the big dressing room and then he made his own. Right. Got it. Beautiful. The primary bathroom here. I really like this. You can see that same contemporary Miami chic vibe that you saw throughout the house in here. Everything in here was as it was when they moved in, except for this custom tub. An NBA player needs a little bit larger than normal tub. Yeah, I would say this is a custom tub. Tub, that's probably the biggest tub I've seen. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a big tub. And this is one of the reasons they really fell in love with the home. Off this primary suite, this huge balcony overlooking the resort-like backyard. Oh, beautiful. But we've got pool, water slide, spa, pool cabana with a full bathroom, outdoor kitchen. You've got the fire pit, tennis court, and of course, another, another court. basketball court. <laughs> it's only a few days on the market for the listing price of? $10 million. <laughs> so when are we moving in? Right? $10 million, <laughs> but then you gotta get the home loan for it and the whole deal. If we go half seas, yeah. and maybe get a couple more people to chip in, we're there. <laughs> Party house. I love how Bradley Beal had the arcade basketball hoop above the basketball court. Yep, obviously necessary. I, I feel like it would be such a great house for parties. Yes. Like, oh my gosh. On an Airbnb <laughs> situation? Yes. Oh my gosh. So next on the rundown, Amy, you got to check out a very special Scholastic book fair as well. I did, and it involved some VIP guests from the Commanders. You won't want to miss this. Coming up, how new team leadership is fostering a love for learning. Stick around. And a very special surprise for some D.C. elementary school students. They got to experience their first Scholastic Book Fair, hang out with News 4's Amy Cho, and meet some Washington <laughs> football players. Yeah, that was the real draw. Obviously <laughs> not me. But this was all part of the Commander's Literacy Program in the DMV. I got a chance to check it out this morning. Do y'all read Dog Man? Yeah. All right. It's not every day you get to go shopping with a famous football player. All right, good job. What do you got? What's that one about? Former Washington cornerback Josh Wilson lending a helping hand here at Savoy Elementary School in Anacostia. The Commanders helped sponsor this book fair, letting every student at the school take home eight books for free. I would love to read these when I write when I get home because I love reading. It's one of my favorite things to do. It's fun to me, and um, I want to be a reading teacher when I grow up. The book fair is part of a program called Commanders Read. 
It's aimed at increasing literacy all around the D.C. area and letting kids know that even athletes love learning. Team President Jason Wright. As much as they worked on their bodies, they also read and worked on their minds. That's exactly what legendary quarterback Doug Williams did. I've always been a person to want to go out in the community for the kids. Because number one, growing up, I had somebody to do the same thing for me. Lifting up local kids. That's what Marjorie Harris, wife of new team owner Josh Harris, says is one of her biggest goals. Josh and I always said that being an owner of a team is not really owning a team, but it's about having a community asset that you give back to the community. And what better way to start by engaging with the school system and being here at Savoy Elementary. And as for what it was like meeting real life athletes. It was exciting because I never saw a football team in my life. So a lot, a lot, a lot of fun. They were just the cutest. Mm. I was so in love. I could not get enough of them and just their love for reading. And obviously, who doesn't love a Scholastic Book Fair? That was one of the highlights for me when I was in school. So great. And thanks for joining the rundown. We'll see you tomorrow.